We're going to break tradition a little bit, everyone. As soon as Nate gets the music off, ooh, very nice, Nate. We are going to start before Michigan time. So this is very exciting. Uh, we have so much to say today and to talk about together that we want to get started just a little bit early. So good morning and welcome to the first of two all school meetings that we will have in this academic year. It's so exciting to see all of you here. I'm Elizabeth Burmoji and I'm honored to serve as the interim dean of the School of Education. Now we have many new members, new members of the school, of the community, raise your hand so everybody can see and welcome you. Yay, new members. We are just thrilled to have you here. We also have many old members. Did I say old? Old members, raise your hands. You can self-define. <laughs> Some of you old members may actually have seen your past self with some questionable fashion choices from the 80s um, or 90s even uh, in the slideshow. We chose to go way back in time for our slideshow this year because it is our bicentennial year. Now we can't go all the way back to 1817, although some of those photos look like they might have been from 1817, but we can go back to 1921 and our photos obviously don't go back to 1921. What was the oldest one you found, Danielle? Well, those students in front of the University Elementary School were from 20, like the early 20s. Oh, they were, wow. So it looked very serious. Right, but, yeah. right. <laughs> so hopefully you saw some interesting differences between our School of Education in 1921, even 1970, 1990, and now. Um, and that's why we wanted to share those slides with you and also to remember that we're a community of all different kinds of scholars who have a rich tradition of engaging in education research. And you're entering that community if you're new and you're maintaining that community if you're old. So today, we are going to talk about a whole range of things, and I'd like to start by giving you a bit of a sense of our plan for the day. So first, we'll have our leadership team uh, tell you about some of the different priorities and initiatives that we'll be working on this year. We're going to do that here. I'll speak and then our Senior Associate Dean for Research and Graduate Studies, Ed Silver, will speak. And then our Associate Dean for Undergraduate and Teacher Education, Sherry Saunders, will speak. Then we'll move into breakout sessions. And so we want you to really listen carefully to those initiatives. Oh, I'm sorry, I forgot uh, that our managing director and our design coordinator of CEDAR will also speak about a really interesting new initiative that we want to engage you in. So listen carefully because we want you, after you hear about some of these different initiatives and priorities, to choose a working group. We're going to have conversations instead of us talking at you for the entire time, we're going to talk together and really try to figure out how to work as a community going forward. Then we'll have a wonderful lunch and you're going to move briskly from your breakout rooms to the lunch space and you're going to do that because the provost is going to be there and she's going to speak at 11.30 and she has to leave at noon. So we want to make sure that she has time to speak and then we have time to ask her questions. So we'll get you in there. Um, our event planners assure me that we can move all of you from one space to another by 11.30 and have you seated and looking you know, bright and sunny for the provost. We'll hear from her and then we'll have the next half hour just for informal community conversation, no structured kind of schedule. And then from one to three, you're invited to visit some of our new, newly renovated classrooms and to see some demonstrations on the different kinds of technology tools we have available. Pretty exciting. Now before we go any further, I have a few people I have to thank for today. Without Mary Delano, is she in here? Mary, in the back hiding, Lois Hunter, Jean Steffi and Leah Strothman, we would not be here. We would not be standing here. You wouldn't have coffee and you wouldn't have lunch. So say thank you to them for me. 
and equally important, without Danielle Dim Dimcheff and Angela Snow, I wouldn't be standing here, or I would be, but I'd be babbling at you. So both Danielle and Angie really help organize our, um, our talking points for today. So thank you, Danielle. Thank you, Angie, wherever you are. There she is. And I guess I see one person next to Angie who likes to remain anonymous, but that's Katherine Taylor. And Katherine really helped us by sharing slides with us from the past so that we could think about new pieces we wanted to add and old things that we wanted to keep. So thank you, Katherine. All right, with that, oh, sorry, I'm in a hurry. With that, let me turn to a little bit about who we are. So as Danielle and I were planning the slides, we thought about putting in a lot of statistics about who we are. We've done that in the past, and they're very interesting statistics. But we decided that we would make those available to you, so they'll be in the slides that we post, so you'll have access to all of this. But instead of stats, we wanted to focus on our mission and on what we do and try to define ourselves by defining who we are as a community. So that's what I'm going to try to do for you in the next 20 or so minutes. Ed is timing me. He's very, very uh, rigid, so he will, he will make me stop. So um, a number of you have probably seen this. This is how we are defining our mission and our vision for this year. And we've defined it in many similar ways uh, in the past. We are researchers. We study and improve education practice, policy, and the context of teaching and learning. That is core to who we are. That's what makes us unique as a school of education. The fact that we do this kind of research, both its, its incredible rigor and its commitment to improving practice, policy, and context is really different among schools of education. We also educate practitioners, whether teachers, school leaders, higher ed administrators, and so on, policymakers, and researchers. This is a core part of our mission as well. And that mission is brought to life by our commitment to improving education to improve society, and really to make a more just society where all people have access to opportunities to learn. This is critical to what we do. It's part of the work of every single one of you in this building. And we have to come together to do that work. Now, we do it with a strong focus on diversity, inclusion, justice, and equity, which we are referring to as DHE, thanks to Pat Herbs. Raise your hand, Pat. Some of you have already heard about this. Some of you haven't. DHE means I said. And our commitment this year is to speak up, speak out, and tell our stories. Talk about who we are as individuals, and then create a story about who we are as a collective. And part of that work is starting today, as we come together in our working groups. There are several functions of the school that animate this mission, or that make it happen. One is our academic programs. I'm going to talk a bit more about those in a minute. Another is our research and our research infrastructure. Our community engagement and public scholarship is critical. And our fundraising and development is absolutely key to what we do. We, in all of these functions, are served by, oh, and those are all interrelated, by a whole group of people an incredibly important staff who help us communicate our ideas, who help us manage our data, who help with technology support. So there's Joanna Elliott in the back videotaping us right now, and Nate Blunt, who's helping us. He, he really was critical to getting the music to stop and uh, <laughs> my, my voice to come out because I have no clue how to do that. We have student affairs and recruitment folks who, who work to bring new people into our space and support them while they're here. We have a finance team that is the best, the best in the university, I'm convinced of it. We have wonderful human resources people who support us 
throughout all of our different kinds of postings of positions and help us think about how to make sure that all of us, staff, faculty, students, are really supported in our work. And finally, we have a great facilities crew. We have to thank Mike Napolitan as well and Dave Kelly. If they're here, they should raise their hands because they make things happen in the building. They're probably, Joanna saying, upstairs setting up classrooms for the tour. So this is critical. This is part of um, the community. This is the community, or one way to represent it. But there are some other ways to represent our community. So who are we? We are researchers. We do the finest research in the United States, in the world, around education practice, policy, and the context of teaching and learning. We see some beautiful people here who do work on all sorts of things, whether we're studying how children learn science, or how to improve literacy education, or the effects of uh, scholarship programs on recruitment and retention into higher education, or how we um, support all kinds of engagements in classrooms. We are cutting edge researchers. We do work that matters in society. And this is part of the work that you can do as students, as staff members, and as faculty members here. Now, Ed Silver is going to talk a bit more about how we can do a better job of building our research infrastructure. I should say that we are fourth on campus in terms of per capita faculty production of research funding, external research funding. So we're doing pretty well, but I should mention that we're fourth after medicine, the College of Literature, Science, and the Arts, and Engineering. They have a lot more money that they're bringing in, but we clearly are working hard to get grants to support our research, but we can do more. So Ed will talk a little bit about some of his priorities in that area, and if you're interested in that, you can join him in that conversation. We are educators. We have the best academic programs in the country. I'm absolutely convinced of it. We educate teachers. We educate school leaders. We educate uh, researchers, future researchers. We educate the world in reality because our impact in this School of Education has, and I'll borrow a tagline from our campaign last year, an infinite impact. We touch the lives of teachers and leaders and researchers who will then be touching the lives of children and youth and other adults. We teach all kinds of different um, material. We work at the higher education level. We work in K-12. And we really enrich our programs of study as we work together. Sherry Saunders will be leading with um, uh, Chauncey Montesano and Kendra Hearn and Pat Herbst a discussion of academic programs and what we can do to really enliven those programs, to enrich them, to make them even more accessible to all of our uh, students. So if you're interested in that work, please join Sherry, Pat, Chauncey, and Kendra uh, in the working groups. Those groups will be divided into a focus on teacher education and a focus on graduate education with a particular emphasis on how we can actually launch new master's degree programs. On that note, some of the new programs that we're considering are things like youth development and social change, uh, workplace education and training, program evaluation in education, and even our new MicroMasters, which is an all-digital micro-masters micro -masters certificate program that allows people from all over the world to take a whole set of courses and then apply to our full master's degree. So we have a lot of interesting possibilities, and we need your input on whether those possibilities are ones you think would help us draw new populations of students and serve our communities well. We are also public scholars. 
Now this is an area where we've been doing amazing work for many years. We have incredible school partnerships where we're working uh, to really learn from children and teachers and school leaders, even as we're supporting them in advancing new kinds of initiatives. We have all sorts of activities out in the community. We have work happening in Detroit partnering with the College of Engineering to engage young people in learning how to use sensors to study their communities and improve their communities. We have partnerships with the Taubman College of Architecture and Urban Planning to help young people learn how to be architects or at least get interested in architecture programs. We're also doing work in public scholarship at the state level. Several of us have been involved with the third grade reading legislation that some of you may have heard about, the, the concern uh, that we have that uh, the state is going to try to retain third graders who don't pass the state test, and we've voiced the research on retention. We've written documents, Amory Palansar, Nell Duke, and I collaborated to write a document to the state and really tried to move the needle on that legislation. We're also involved in the federal lawsuit that you may have heard about uh, that's actually focusing on Detroit and may go all the way to the Supreme Court. We bring our scholarship to that work. So this is different from service. It is a kind of service, but it's service informed by our research and by our teaching. We'd like to do more in this arena. So if you're interested in thinking about how to advance public scholarship in our School of Education and at the university, please join Debbie Kosnavis, Darren Stockdale, and Henry Mears in their working group. And they'll be talking about some of their ideas, but also trying to hear from you. How do we elevate public scholarship? How do we reward and incentivize it? How do we recognize it in the current structures we have? And finally, we are a community. We are a community of individual people who have different backgrounds, different experiences, different passions. And this community needs to come together to really work on how we take that diversity that we represent and make the most of it how we make sure everyone is included and everyone has a voice, everyone feels like he or she can speak up and speak out and take a stand on social issues. We need to work together as a community for justice and for equity for all people in our community and outside the community. Because we're individuals and because we come from different places, sometimes we hurt each other. We do it unintentionally in most cases and we need to figure out how we can work through that hurt. And so we're launching a number of initiatives. One is the storytelling initiative that I mentioned earlier. By telling our stories, we're going to humanize our experience, but we're not going to just let it sit at the individual level. We're going to try to understand how some stories are privileged and some are marginalized in our society and even in our community. And we're really going to work together to try to change that and become a true community, a true collective. Another initiative I've mentioned to some of you is our book reading. So we're storytelling and we're going to story read. And Kendra Hearn has agreed to help us lead that book club. It's all going to be fiction reading and we're really excited to start the first book reading by reading The Underground Railroad, which is a, a new novel. I saw someone uh, you know, make a face, and a good face, a positive <laughs> face, um, and, and we're going to come together and just talk, just as one would in a book club. So not super structured, but to try to allow us to mine and understand some of the issues that are represented in the novel and then explore those issues in our own experience. But we need to do more. We need to take more concrete action. We need to learn how we can educate each other and ourselves. We know that the tragic events of just this week and last week are going to keep 
happening. And we have to take a stand, we have to do something about it, and we have to do it in a positive way through education. So if you're interested in those kinds of initiatives, please join me and uh, Camille Wilson, somewhere around here, um, I think, uh, to talk about our DHE initiatives and what we could do differently in the school. Oh, I forgot to advance this slide so you could really see what DHE represents. So, there's our mission. DHE is critical to it. All of these functions are critical to it. And all of the people in the space are critical to making this place work the way it does. We hope that you'll become part of this community if you're new to it, and that you'll help, if you're old to it, new people really become key to the community as well. And with that, Oh, I am so good. I am going to turn it over to our senior associate dean, who we fondly refer to, refer to as Sad Silver, um, or sometimes Sad Rags, senior associate dean for research and graduate studies. Here you go, Sad Rags. I was really looking forward to waving a time sign and telling the dean to sit down, and, and, uh, but I don't get to do that. Can you hear me okay? Is this thing, yeah, this thing's working. Can you hear me okay? Yeah, okay. I don't usually have a problem with that, but. Um, so, um, I, I, this uh, job is new to me, um, and it's new to you. Um, the Associate Dean for Research and Graduate Studies did not exist um, prior to uh, July, I guess. Um, and what it does is it, um, it just combines uh, most of what was the traditional job of the Associate Dean for Research with a portion of what was the traditional job of the Associate Dean for Academic Affairs. Um, and uh, we didn't invent it in the School of Education, several other uh, units on campus also combine these roles, research and graduate studies, um, and on several other universities uh, that are peer institutions of ours, um, you also find that title. Although it is probably more typical to separate academic affairs and research into separate positions. But we thought that research and graduate studies went together very, um, very well, and it made a lot of sense to um, when we were uh, thinking about the position to put them together, uh, not only because other people have done it successfully, but also because there's a lot of ways in which these two spheres uh, interact with each other. A lot of what we do in our doctoral programs, of course, is we're preparing people for careers uh, as scholars and researchers in the field. And so there's a natural connection between the things we do in our doctoral programs and uh, the scholarship of the faculty. Um, also, the scholarship of the faculty often uh, produces forms of support that um, assist graduate students in pursuing their degrees. And we'd like to think that the research of the school integrates everything that we do, including undergraduate programs and teacher education and so on, um, and, and, and it does. Um, but there's a particular affinity between graduate studies and, and research. And so the Com combining of these positions uh, makes a lot of sense conceptually. But then procedurally, there's a lot of things to figure out because people are accustomed to the going to the Associate Dean for Academic Affairs for everything that has to do with academics. And now you have to figure out, do I go to, to this guy or do I go to that lady and uh, who do I go to and so on. So anyway, we have a, we have a little bit of, um, we've been, uh, Sherry and I have been working with the staff to figure out how different processes that used to be handled in one way will now get handled a little bit differently. And uh, we'll try not to, to take too long doing that, but we, we appreciate your patience while we, while we work through some of the kinks. And um, anyway, um, so the main point that um, I think I want to pick up on a couple of things that um, uh, Elizabeth said in her remarks. Um, and um, just identify, I don't know that I would call these um, uh, my priorities for the year, but, but I want to say that these, I think, are the initial 
focal points, and I would like to think that next year they would be different, but I have a feeling that a lot of these ideas are going to take a little bit of time to work on, and so they're stated in, in sort of general ways because I don't feel yet like I know enough about the deep specifics to have really detailed um, plans, and I'm hoping that you will help uh, me learn enough to figure out how I can use whatever resources and opportunities are associated with my position to leverage the kinds of improvements and changes that we need to make. So, so I'm really counting on the staff and the students and the faculty to help, to, uh, to help me identify the places where I ought to devote my energy. Um, there's a lot of work just in this job in keeping the trains running on time, um, and I will try to make sure that we don't, uh, the trains never fall behind schedule, but, but, um, but there's a lot of other things that um, we want to be doing as well. Okay, so um, let me say first, uh, and it's the topic of the, um, of the breakout group, so we can have a more extended conversation about this. Uh, in her slides, uh, uh, Dean Moji put, uh, put up the, the notion that research infrastructure is one of the core elements of the School of Education. Doesn't sound very exciting, certainly doesn't sound as exciting as any of the other breakout groups, but I invite you to come and talk with me about how we can make it um, more, uh, even stronger. I mean, I think we're doing very well, as the dean said. Um, we, have, we have been amazingly productive as researchers in the school, both faculty, particularly faculty in the statistics that uh, the dean was talking about, but also our students. And, and I think we do very well. Sometimes I think it's harder to do that well than it needs to be. And if we could figure out how to get the machine uh, oiled a little bit better, uh, we might be able to do more with less effort, or we might be able to do even more with the same amount of effort. And um, so I think that figuring out how to, how to make the system work well uh, for everyone involved is really important. And infrastructure means a lot of different things. It isn't only sort of institutional, it isn't offices and, and so on, it's people and it's processes and it's education and it's it's, it's capitalizing on all the opportunities in the, in the context of the University of Michigan, which is a great research university. And it's a core part of our mission as a school of education at the University of Michigan to be engaged in this activity. So the other thing I'm, I'm really interested in, in terms of, and notice how clever this slide is, okay? Uh, Danielle uh, helped me with this, but notice the blue and maize. Okay, the blue items are the research part of my uh, portfolio, um, and the maze items are the graduate studies part of my portfolio. Pretty clever, don't you think? <laughs> yes? Yeah. yeah, okay, thank you. All right, so the other thing on the research side is really figuring out how to promote and leverage the research of the faculty. I mean, um, when I look at websites of other schools and on this campus and websites of other universities, Somehow I see the work of individuals featured more than I see it in, in our presentation of self. And so I want to figure out how we could do a better job of promoting what we're already doing and leveraging the research that we're engaged in already to, for new opportunities. So that's the research side. On the graduate studies side, which I won't be part of the academic uh, programs conversation, but there will be uh, some of those um, uh, conversations going on uh, and, I'll, and I'll catch up on those uh, afterwards. Um, I think we want to be looking hard at what we do um, and, and how to make sure we're doing it as well as we can do it. And then we also want to be looking at new opportunities, um, particularly at the master's level where we have been under, uh, under enrolled and uh, underperforming, but, um, but also at the doctoral level thinking about what are the opportunities um, that we can, what are the things we can be doing um, and what are the things that would really enhance the opportunities for more and more students to take advantage of the high class education opportunities here at the University of Michigan. And then the, the other thing is I want to make sure that we're making the best possible use of the financial resources that we have available and that we get as many more financial resources as possible to use to support graduate students in the pursuit of their educational goals. One of the things about graduate study and education that's different from business and engineering and, and, um, and certainly business different from law and medicine and other, other fields is that people don't make a lot of money when they finish. Um, 
And, um, and nobody pays for you to come. Uh, employers don't pay your way like they do in business and engineering. And you don't make a ton of money like doctors and lawyers. So graduate education in our field is expensive. We need to find ways, more and better ways, to support that. So that's um, the few things that are on my agenda. And maybe next year we'll have all those done and we can move on to new ones. Um, <laughs> but my hunch is, with your help, we'll continue to work on this this year and, um, and into the future and get better and better at doing these things. So now I'm going to turn things over to Sherry Saunders. Okay, so I think I'm that lady that you would go to if you don't go to that man. Um, <clears throat> and my area is um, undergraduate education and um, teacher education, but it's also school partnerships. And I also have the Office of Student Affairs and Career Services. So when you have issues around those things, that would be me, okay? Now, unlike Ed, I have a whole lot of things that I want to, um, as priorities. I can't claim them as goals. Um, and I will say they're priorities, but you can push back on those with me, um, perhaps. Um, we'll see. But I'm going to start by um, talking about undergraduate education, my priorities around that. And I've been in conversations with some of you, and I've learned that through undergraduate courses that we offer, we're not only exposing students to educational issues, learning, teaching, mentoring, et cetera, but we are, in some cases, igniting a deeper interest in these and other areas and a desire to continue taking courses with us, which I think is very exciting, and I am very eager to continue to see this um, these kinds of things happening and make this work. So one of my first priorities, and this is the other thing that I want to tell you, I've never actually used a remote before, so I'm not even sure which button I'm supposed to be pushing, but if I start talking to you about priorities and you don't see any up there, let me know, okay? And then Danielle can come up and push it for it's me. It's actually kind of confusing because it totally faded because it's been... Oh, pushed all this. Yes. Oh, there's supposed to be an arrow and it's just a black button. Okay, so my first one is sustaining the existing undergraduate courses we have. So we have some courses that have been very successful in bringing in lots of students, and we want to make sure that those stay. My second priority is heightening the undergraduate, undergraduate students' awareness of our course offerings. And this is where we really, really need your help, because we really need to understand how we can get information out to undergraduate students and how do we do it in a way that sparks their curiosity about what we have to offer. So I imagine we have people in here who are undergraduates, so you need to think about you and what would do that for you and help us learn that. And then there are others of you who have been undergraduates or you know about platforms, help us know what you know. So be sure to send me some emails so we know how to get this done. And then the third one is exploring the feasibility of generating an education minor and as one way to offer students a coherent set of experiences around a particular topic. And so I've been in conversations with a couple of people, um, but I also know that we have some faculty who have been very deliberate in their development of individual courses and have thought about how to put them together in coherent ways, and I want to continue to support that work. So unfortunately, we don't have an undergraduate education um, little session. So if you have information and ideas, or if you have a different set of priorities that you want me to know about, be sure to send me an email. Um, you can find me on the website. You know how I look now. So look <laughs> for my email. OK, so my second area is teacher education. So um, even though we have really strong teacher education programs, we always want to think about what we can do to better, they're, they're, I'm not ready yet. <laughs> we always want to think about how we can do better and strengthen them, right? So for example, I know that some of our teaching interns aren't always sure how to effectively respond to some forms of student behavior. So for me, one of the ways that we can strengthen our program in this area is to develop our teaching interns' knowledge about restorative practices, trauma-informed practices, and social-emotional learning. These are my agenda. I know the people who work with me like say, look at her. She's putting her agenda out there. Yes, I am. Um, <laughs> and use this knowledge to identify concrete steps that they can take to respond in more humane ways to students who are having behavioral struggles. 
So because we're gonna have this teacher education working group later this morning, I gave this as an example to set the stage for some idea generation, okay? So now I'm going to share, I'm gonna try, my five priorities, okay, along with questions that I'd like others of, other, of, of others of you to think through with me, and I hope that these will also encourage some idea generation later today. So my um, first priority is incorporating DHA in meaningful ways in our teacher education programs. So the question that I want us to be thinking about is how do we make sure that diversity, inclusion, justice, and equity are meaningfully woven throughout everything we do so that teaching interns have foundational knowledge and skills to do this work no matter who, where, or what they teach. So that's the first one. The second one is fostering the development of teaching interns who effectively facilitate the learning of the whole child. So here, what our challenge is, is how do we achieve the appropriate balance between addressing the academic dimensions of teaching and learning and the social emotional dimensions of teaching and learning while providing interns with meaningful opportunities for ongoing practice. And when I say ongoing practice, I mean every term on both dimensions. So those of you who are teaching interns are also gonna have this struggle in your classrooms because you're gonna be trying to figure out how to facilitate your students' academic learning as well as their social emotional learning and development. So all of us need to be in conversation about how to make this happen. My third priority is supporting interns in developing knowledge and skills needed to work in underserved communities. So I have a few questions here, like, what do teaching interns need to know and be able to do if they're going to be effective teaching in underserved schools and communities? And what structures and experiences can we create that will help them be, as some people around here say, well-started beginners in underserved settings? My fourth priority is rethinking recruitment to teacher education programs. So we're in this really interesting moment right now where we're simultaneously experiencing teacher shortages throughout the country and we're experiencing declining enrollments in university-based teacher education programs. So given this reality, how can we increase the number and quality of people who want to enroll in our teacher ed programs? Are there strategies that we need to know about that we should do? But are there things about our program that make us really different when we look at all teacher education programs that we can put forward? So that's the kind of thinking that I need folks to be doing there. And then my last one, well, this is my last one for today because I have a limited amount of time. I have more. Um, is assisting teaching interns in making well-informed decisions about appropriate first-year work context. So we want all of our graduates to have long and successful careers in teaching. And we want you, those of you who are going to be our graduates, to make well-informed decisions about where you start your teaching careers. So some of the things that we need to be thinking about are what do teaching interns need to understand about themselves and their potential work context in order to make wise choices about job offers that they get. And then the second part is what are the kinds of structures of support that we need to create for our program graduates who find themselves in settings that are far more challenging than they anticipated. So those are my priorities. And I think, am I a fast talker? Because I think some people think I am. <laughs> And I, I think I might have gotten through quickly, but those are my priorities. And so they may or may not fit with yours. So come to the teacher ed um, working group with your ideas related to the questions that I posed or bring your own priorities to the conversation. We want diversity of perspectives. We're really doing important um, work and I need everybody's ideas about how to make that work. Okay, you coming? All right, and those of you, so I know, I know all of you want to come, but since you can't um, and you have to go to other sessions, um, if you've got ideas, because everybody's got, people got ideas about these things, so if you've got ideas, email them to me. If you're one of those people who wants that face-to-face -face contact, you can do that as well, but you're going to have to go through Lois Hunter, L.R. Hunter, because she handles my calendar, something that no one's ever done before and you seem to get when you get into positions like these. Okay? All right, so that's it. <laughs> Nate Phipps is coming up with, I think, Darren. Great, so Darren and I have the exciting task of telling you about the Innovation in Action uh, student competition and the Learning Levers Prize. So we're talking about two things. One is a process and one is a prize. 
Um, so the Innovation in Action student competition is both sort of in and of itself an innovation in education and also a way to sort of develop an innovator's toolkit to sort of bring to bear on challenges in education. So um, I'm going to tell you a little bit about the competition and then I'm going to pass it to Darren. Um, so it's a, the innovation, we're talking about two things, innovation in action and learning levers. Innovation in action is a five month uh, student competition that's interdisciplinary. It asks students to form teams across the university and then sort of identify and try to innovate around a challenge in education. So. Uh, thinking of the challenge is probably not a hard thing for, for folks in this room, um, but really thinking through, um, think, you know, engaging in design thinking, customer discovery, sort of this social entrepreneurship toolkit, uh, as well as an interface toolkit, to think through that problem and really sort of hone in and focus on um, what really is the challenge, right? Because often when we think of something as a challenge, we then talk to the folks that experience that challenge and decide that it's, it's a little different than we expected. And that's sort of part of this process. Um, so over the five months after you've sort of identified a challenge and started to work with your team, um, again, acr from across campus, you, you are engaging in these workshops and sort of digging deep in it. It's co-curricular, it's not for credit, but it is a sort of really deep, uh, engaging intellectual experience. Um, and at the end, you pitch to a panel of judges who uh, potentially could offer you cash prizes. There are cash prizes at the end. Um, and we can tell you a little bit in the session about what other teams have developed. So last year, for instance, a team called Formativity. Um, folks from the School of Information, the Policy School, and the School of Education developed a stealth assessment tool using sort of gameful experiences in um, pre-K classrooms in South Africa. Um, they won $10,000 to take their sort of product, if you will, to, um, to sort of scale it up. And now one of the students from the Ford School is in South Africa implementing the solution uh, in pre-K classrooms in South Africa. So it sort of is a very real thing. Um, that's not always what happens at the end of the competition. It's, there's sort of a, a idea that you might carry it forward, but it really is very much about the process. That is sort of in uh, juxtaposition in some ways to the Learning Levers Prize, which is really meant to sort of uh, encourage innovation around education uh, and encourage you to take it forward. So it's $25,000. Um, and it is sort of seed funding in a way to take an innovation that has a lot of potential and then bring it forward in the sort of next, you know, months and, and years even um, to sort of bring it to, to sort of scale it, right? So something that has a lot of potential um, that could really make an impact to sort of scale it. So innovation in action and learning levers are, are sort of commingled, but they're, they're very much separate. You don't need to go through innovation in action to experience learning levers. Learning levers is, a, is in itself sort of a pitch uh, style, but you, you don't need to necessarily have had that innovation in action experience. So we're, we're sort of talking about them both because they are connected, but they're, they're, they're a little bit different. Um, I'm going to turn it over to Darren, who's going to tell you why we've sort of, so this is a competition that started last year in education, but it's been run out of the School of Public Health for four years. This is their fourth year. This is our second year. Um, and so we've learned a lot from them, but we're really happy that education has sort of been brought on through a, a third century grant last year. And uh, I'm going to ask Darren to sort of tell you why we've sort of come to understand it's so important to have education at the table. Um, around these sorts of things. It's certainly a new sort of vocabulary and skill set for me as somebody who comes from a more traditional sort of education background. Um, but I think Darren and I are both sort of, we've, we're sort of sold on why this is so important and why folks like you in this room who do come from education uh, need to sort of be at the table around innovation and social entrepreneurship. Hi, everybody. So I'll start off by talking about why you might not want to participate. In this is what happens with people like, this is my own first knee-jerk reaction when I heard the word entrepreneurship, right? I'm public education, we're fighting to protect public education, we don't want to privatize education, you know, there's a lot of work and there's some really bad things happening out there. And so when we hear the word entrepreneurship, sometimes we kind of pull back a little bit. Um, but social entrepreneurship is not about profit making, it's about making a social impact, and so there's a sort of a different angle. And here's the other thing, I'll start this off. Um, anybody who's worked with me long enough has experienced one of my rants about what I call the Marzano effect. And if there's any Marzano fans out there, I'm sorry. But um, here's what the Marzano effect looks like in practice. I was working with teachers in a school in Flint last year, and high school teachers, and they were t showing me, these were science teachers, showing me their vocabulary list that they were required by central office to use because they're a priority school and they have to do this thing called instructional learning cycle. It's part of the whole state mandated system of reform. And they were, so like you had 
they were using a list of like 50 terms that Marzano had published in one of his books as the essential vocabulary words that they were supposed to teach in science. So he had biology teachers teaching physics words out of context and then giving a quiz on it and they were required to do this. So this is why I think we need to do innovation in action. People, there are companies out there that are really, really good at identifying a customer base, at marketing a product, and at passing off their products as research-based. And then there's real, the best research in the world, like Elizabeth said, is happening here. To be quite frank, we need to do a better job at selling it. We need to identify our customer base, we need to market it a little bit more effectively and kind of get it out there and push back a little bit. And so this innovation in action experience gives you that experience. You learn how to um, do customer discovery, how to develop a pitch, how to sell an idea. So it's really important in terms of a skill set that we don't often develop here. Um, and so it's like this new set of skill set. And I just think that that's kind of the, the angle I've been taking about why it's so important. How do we really get innovative, but then again, and it really aligns well with this new initiative around storytelling. How do we tell the story of our work better so that it's getting out there and getting into the hands of administrators and districts and superintendents and the people who make these decisions? So that's what we want to do. And so Innovation in Action is a great space to learn how to do that. So I'll say one last thing. The uh, session is on Innovation in Action and Learning Levers. It's, uh, anybody is welcome. It is very much student facing because it's, it's a student competition. Um, we're going to sort of do a really short info session, something you'd experience if you went to one of our larger info sessions. We're sort of an outreach and recruitment mode for teams. Uh, each team, each education team is required to have an education student. One thing we know, we've noticed is that there are a lot of teams coming from across the university that have ideas about education and want to form teams, but they are not, they're not from, edu uh, the sort of, again, the sort of school institutional um, formal education sphere and we need folks like you all to come out and sort of join their teams and really help them access the sort of what we know to be the sort of best practices the sort of research base around education that otherwise they're just they're they're gonna they're gonna go forward they're gonna try to innovate around these issues sort of without us at the table so that's our sort of plea um, again faculty staff you're welcome to come this is a, stu uh, a student competition so ultimately that's sort of where the audience is um, so it'll be part info session and then part discussion about uh, challenges in education which again should not be a hard topic for us to approach quick example there's this amazing team forming around biomes and there's a woman who who is collaborating already with people from architecture and engineering and science to create living biome labs, and she wants to build them on the tops of schools and connect them to science curricula. How cool is that, right? Getting kids like studying these little mini ecosystems and as a learning lab while also learning. So there's really amazing ideas out there, but she's got no educators on her team. So science ed people, talk to us. We'll hook you up. All right? There's some really okay, exciting thank you. stuff happening. Thank you, guys. I want to say just a couple things. First of all, again, thank you, Nate, for making the magic of my voice coming out of this without me having to do anything. Um, and thank you to all of our presenters, uh, Sad Silver, Ad Saunders, and our Cedar team. I want to say that uh, Innovation in Action slash Learning Levers is a great example of multiple functions of our school coming together. It came out of uh, a third century grant, so that's provost funding last year. It's been advanced by fundraising, so a generous gift from a donor and the continued promise to raise funds so that we can continue this for another five years at least. And then our academic program. So all the things that students are learning in courses and all the research that we do can come together to inform these innovations. So I really urge you, um, if you're a student in particular, to go to that information session. Now, I have a few uh, quick things to say just to um, move us on. We're, we're doing really well in terms of time. The first thing before I forget to say it is that Danielle made me promise, for those of you who were in the room when the music was playing, that I would tell you that what might have sounded like blurred lines was Word Crimes by Weird Al Yankovic. We were not playing blurred lines in the School of Education's all school meeting. So we wanted you to know that. Danielle got a little nervous because it was hard to hear and she picked the music, so she didn't want to be blamed for all that. All education related. All education related. When we didn't get to, we don't need no education, that was my uh, choice, but um, so I was very sad. 
You know the words, right? We don't need no thought control, no dark sarcasm. All right, I'll move on. Um, I just want to remind you that we will be having an open house, classroom open house and demonstrations. So after uh, the provost speaks and after we have lunch, these start at 1 o'clock and you're just on your own to go experience all the wonderful things that are happening with our new renovations. There are a lot of cool features. Um, I think faculty members may want to go learn about them so you know how to use them when you teach. Um, but uh, you know, all, all of our students are also welcome to join us there. And then uh, finally, it is our bicentennial. And we have chosen for our tagline, always educating, forever valiant. The whole university, every unit had to choose a tagline. So we picked always educating, even though we, we toyed with things like always learning, because in fact, educators are actually always learning, or always transforming, or always teaching. We decided always educating really encompassed all of those things, and also cued people up to think about the School of Education. I believe there was Ted here, Ted Montgomery. I believe there will be t-shirts made with this tagline. So we'll get some, we'll try to distribute them, but if you don't get one, go buy one and wear it every day <laughs> to help recruit people into our School of Education. I have to tell you, I had to go to a dean's meeting up north and I was forced to stop and do a little bit of shopping while I was at the meeting. And I found out that the shopkeeper's son is a biology major graduating this year from the University of Michigan. So I recruited him into our MAC program. So we are all recruiters. We are all always coming in contact with all sorts of fabulous people who could be students, who can be undergraduate students, master's degree students, PhD students. So please invite them into to our school and wear your bicentennial t-shirt. These are the dates for some of the different bicentennial activities. Um, they will be obviously going on into the fall because that's really when we'll hit the bicentennial year. Um, so please try to jot those down and um, be part of the university community as we move into our third century. All right. With that, breakout sessions, if you are interested in helping Associate Dean Silver really work on building a strong research infrastructure, and this is open to faculty, students, and staff, please go to 1322 Tribute. And by the way, you don't have to me memorize these. 1322 Tribute, that Tribute is the name of the room, it's not a different building. 1322 is the number, Tribute is the name. We have these cute little things that Jean and Leah made. Um, so you could have picked one up out at the table or you can get one here um, if, you're, if you forget the number of the room. Uh, if you're interested in working on developing our academic programs, uh, we're going to do strengthening teacher education programs and developing new masters in 2346. We'll have to split into two groups, but that should not uh, shape your decision to attend. Um, it might be a little bit packed, but please, if you're interested in academic programs, go there. Community Engagement and Public Scholarship 2228 upstairs, um, as, as is the, the academic programs piece. DHEA initiatives will meet in Brownlee, which is upstairs uh, at the end of the hallway. And um, then Learning Levers and Innovation in Action also upstairs in 2334. Are there any questions? Everybody knows your assignment? Okay. And then we'll see you back in Prector. Head back there about 11 o'clock. Be sitting down and ready to learn from the provost. We'll see you there.